Brothers and sisters, we have got so many questions that have come up here. If he was to try to answer every one of those properly, we would probably never get away from here tonight. So what we're going to do is we're going to go until about 6. That's another 25 minutes. And then we will save these questions, and we may have another time if we can squeeze it in to be able to uh, answer more of these questions. Because these are your questions. This is what's on your mind, and uh, we want to make sure that we try to come up with the answers while he's here. Otherwise, you're going to come and ask me, and I, I may not have all the answers like he does. And I don't have a friend like he's got. We're going to pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer. If you want to stand, let's stand. Oh, you've blessed us. You've blessed us so far, Lord. You will continue. We've got a lot of questions. We want some answers. The answers can only come from you, so your spirit must speak through these men to be able to answer those things. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Are we ready to continue? Now, we're not censoring these questions, and I haven't read them beforehand. You can see they're coming in. So I'm taking them as they come off the top of the pile. So if they're new, they're going to be somewhere at the end, which means we'll probably not get to them today. So be patient, because every question is something that bothers someone, right? Uh, would you please address spiritual formation? What is it? What are its dangers? I hear that some of our people are getting involved. In my series called Rekindling the Reformation, there are two lectures, and they're long lectures about over two hours long, each one of them. And they're called The Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation, Part 1, and The Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation, Part 2. And they actually form a unit, but spiritual formation is dealt with in Part 2. But it would be look good to look at both of them. Now, what is spiritual formation? Spiritual formation is the counterfeit of the gospel. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means faith is based on the word of God. Jesus said so, therefore it is so. I do not have to feel it. I do not have to experience it. I have to believe it. Does God hear my prayer or does it hit the ceiling? I know Baal was deaf because Elijah said maybe he's far away, maybe he's sleeping, maybe he's not hearing. Francis, Elijah was very naughty. What else did he say? Easy on the toilet. <laughs> Easy on the toilet. I know my God is not deaf and that he hears the faintest prayer. Do I have to say to him, Lord, I want to have proof that I am your child and that you love me. Please give me an experience. Let me fall over, be slain in the spirit, or speak in tongues, or put gold dust on my head. Is that biblical? No. Because then it's no longer faith. It becomes substance. Is that right? 
I don't have to ask God, do you love me? Because the Bible said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. He says he loves me. By asking him to show me that he loves me, I am showing my disbelief. Isn't that right? So any form of experiential religion is dangerous. And so a religion that seeks to have an encounter experience is not from God. And spiritual formation does exactly that. It uses visualization. Now please, there's a huge difference between imagination and visualization. I can imagine what it's like to be back home. But visualization is something else. In visualization, you place yourself within the setting of the story. So you take a biblical story, whatever, Wedding of Cana. You place yourself in the setting and then you start using your senses to experience the story. You smell, you feel, you hear, you see. And then you see the figures in your mind and you normally do it in a quiet place with your eyes closed and you see the figures and you hear what Mary is saying to Jesus and what Jesus is saying to the others. And eventually you start becoming involved with the characters and the characters become real and they communicate with you. That's spiritism. Now this communication becomes personal and it could be on a highly spiritual level, but that level becomes your norm and no longer the Word of God. So the spirit becomes nominative. And only when you have this encounter experience with God will you have the special euphoria of having been accepted by God. That's spiritism. And it's not from God. And it was introduced by the Jesuits. And Loyola was the champion of spiritual formation in his spiritual exercises and they are all based on that experience contemplative prayer secret little places where you have to go and have a communication repetitive words saying a word over and over even the word jesus 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 until your brain dead <laughs> and then you get these impressions in your mind and that becomes your religion. It's not from God, it's from the devil. And whether it's taught at a Catholic university, like the University of Loyola, or whether it's taught at an Adventist institution, it's not from God. Because we are a word-based people, we don't need experiential religion. God said it, I believe it. Did he die for me? Yes, he died for me. Does he love me? Yes, I love me. If I repent, will he accept me? Yes. Will the devil try to convince me that I'm not accepted? Yes, all the time. But I prefer to believe God and not the devil. So you don't need all of this hocus pocus. Believe the word. I'm probably going to be dead after that. Using prophetic imagery, women, churches, or am I reading the, oh, sorry, start this side. Isaiah 4 verse 1 reads, and in that day seven women shall take of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name and to take away our reproach. Women equals churches, seven perfect, complete, one man, Jesus. Does it mean that all the churches are saying to Jesus that they want their own righteousness and their own doctrines and still be called Christian? Is that an accurate reading? Francie? It's too difficult. 
I think the Bible commentary has got something to say about that. But that's a very long explanation. I think we should go to the next question. <laughs> All right, let's just say that at the end of time, the churches will be looking for Christ and will not find him. But the truth will be there and it will be able to be found if you search for it with your whole heart as you search for hidden treasure. But if the time of probation is over, then it is too late. Just curious to know as to why we would be building houses in heaven if God already has mansions for us. Question number one. Well, everyone gets two dwellings. That's the beauty of heaven. And you have the type in ancient Israel. When there were problems, the people lived in the city. The city was their protection, the wall around the city. So it became a symbol of the law as well. We don't have to go into all of that typology, but they had their country dwelling where they lived on their lands, which they got as an inheritance. And nobody was allowed to take that inheritance away. If they got into trouble, they could sell that inheritance, but they had to receive it back in the Jubilee. It was a permanent inheritance, symbol of another permanent inheritance. After the millennium when Christ returns and he restores this earth, you will have two dwellings. One in the city that was built by whom? And the meek shall inherit the land. Yeah. And uh, the other one, the Bible says, you will build houses and not others live in them. You will plant vineyards and not others eat of them. That doesn't mean that you won't have friends. It just means you won't be kicked off your land. How many houses have we had in our life? We're like nomads. How many? You've lost count. 25. At least. We've moved 25 times at least. I don't want to move again. <laughs> Every house I plant an avocado tree. And I've never eaten one. <laughs> I think I can only wait for this place. So you will build a house, and you will live at it, and nobody, there will be no land claim, you will not be kicked off your land. There will be no highway going through it, and your land disappropriated. You're going to live in it, and you're going to have your own vineyards. But you also have a house in the city. You're not going to be a sponge. But you're going to have lots of friends in your house. Oops, there's another question on there. Why Adam and Eve did not have any children in the Garden of Eden? How long do you think they lived in it? Francie, have you got something to say? That's speculative. Do not go beyond what is written. Are we allowed to speculate a little bit? Very little. <laughs> you know, how long did they live in the Garden of Eden? Was Eve stunning? Man, she must have been a bombshell. <laughs> Too big for me, but she was a bombshell. <laughs> If I was Adam, I wouldn't have waited 50 years <laughs> to give her a kiss. <laughs> right? So I don't know when they transgressed. It could have been long, or it could have been short. The Bible doesn't say. You know, there's an old notion which says, strike while the iron is hot. Speculation, pure speculation, you said just a little bit. They had a high day, a Sabbath with God. And they spent the whole day with God and learned so many wonderful things and saw their creator 
really for the first time except for those few minutes the previous night. But there were many, many, many unanswered questions. And on that first day of the week, they looked and they studied their environment and looked at the tree of life and maybe she wandered off. And maybe she didn't have enough time to be fully grounded and believe and it was time to strike and maybe he got her the very next day. It's just possible. It could have been short. It could have been long. And he's so exalted that he made it his day of victory, the first day of the week I got her. It's just a possibility. That's why they didn't have children. They didn't have time. But it could have been long, so don't quote me. Daniel chapter 11. By representation, the king of the north is the papacy and by extension must include the United States. Good point. And the king of the south is Islam. Well, I would actually go beyond Islam. The king of the south must be more than Islam. Everything that openly opposes the truth and Christianity is the king of the south. So that includes any religious system which is an open antagonist plus atheism and all the ism philosophies, spiritism, etc. Right? And the king of the north is one that apparently embraces Christianity. He takes the place of the king of Babylon and Rome was called Babylon, even by Peter. So yes, this power will wield its economic and political power using the political power of the state. Who is the spiritual leader of the armies of the United States of America, officially? Always the Cardinal of the Knights of Malta, the Cardinal of New York. Currently, it is Cardinal Egan. So, yes. As such, would you agree with the events of 9-11 start in Daniel 9 verse 40? Please do a presentation on this in the very future. Thank you. Well, whether it starts exactly with 9-11 or not, I don't think we could go so far as to say that's the absolute start of that event. But at the time of the end, there will be a thrust for this anti-Christian power, this anti-Christ power, to conquer in its mark and to overthrow all other ideologies without them even knowing it and accepting his mark. It'll be economic legislation. I gave a lecture just the other day. Francie, do you think we should repeat that lecture here because so many people missed it? I hear the rumbling. Yes. 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 Can we see the hands? Yes. Now, the It'll be on Monday. In San Diego, would they be very upset if I repeated the lecture here for the sake of those people here? No, you would not be. Monday evening. Arranged. Carry on. Okay. All right. Monday evening we have the lecture. I'll do, I hear the rumbling again. So that you understand where we are in the stream of time. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll do the worst ones later. We have to avoid stoning somehow, huh? Yes. Could you share stories about how God is working in our church? We are encouraged by hearing these. Thank you. You know, God permits apostasy so that the difference between what is right and what is wrong becomes so apparent, as I said before, that even a child can see it, right? 
And we have some areas where it is so bad that apostasy is throwing out people that are really serious about their religion. Of course, the devil is very clever and he has a lot of fanatics as well. And you can make anything your religion. You can make diet your religion. Don't make diet your religion. Salvation by gastronomy. There's no such thing. Do what is right and leave the consequences to God. But don't, if you manage to overcome one issue in your life, lift up the banner and say, look at me, I'm holy. Because they are, you are standing on a banana peel while you are saying that. <laughs> Two banana peels, right? One under each foot. So, yes, we have all these factions in the church. And there seems to be a war going on in the church. By the way, that is in perfect harmony with what happened to ancient Israel, and we'll be doing a lecture on that. So this church is perfect when it comes to fulfilling typological prophecy. So now, the question is, what are the good things that are happening? The good things that are happening is that because the situation in some places has become so intolerable in terms of apostasy to what the pioneers and the pillars of this church stand for, that there is a groundswell. We can hear it. You can hear the groundswell, eh? <laughs> and the youth is beginning to stand up. And we have these mega movements. Don't underestimate the youth. Some of these old fogies in the church. Do you know any of the old fogies, Francie? You don't Not know as any. a young person. No, no you, don't, you don't know any. Some of these people think that the youth is stupid. They think that filling them with boom, boom, bash will keep them in the church. And this is the way to win new converts. Man. I was in England at the... Oops, I said England. Uh, I'll rephrase it. I was on an island. <laughs> the British island. <laughs> Close to France. <laughs> and they had this rock concert amongst the youth. I've told the story many times. And it's a long camp meeting. It goes over 10 days. And it was a noddy camp meeting. Because I would give one message and someone else would give another message. And the youth would, you know, do its thing. They would jump onto tables, bash their butts against each other, and they had eight drum sets on the stage. Foof. Well, I don't know whether it was exactly eight, but it must have been close. I mean, I have never seen a mega rock band with so many drum sets on the stage. And uh, I was walking around there, listening to them, and none of them hardly attended my meetings, and I had one in that hall, and all of a sudden, halfway through my meeting, the hall was back. And I thought, wow, this is great. They're all coming to listen, but they all fell asleep. They were bored. Then I realized no, they were waiting for the concert, which was just afterwards. <laughs> it's discouraging, right? And the next day I was walking around there, and they were boom, boom, bashing inside there. And there was a young West Indian man, a black man, standing outside in his 20s. And he was standing at the door. So I walked up to him and uh, you know, I asked him kindly, what are you doing here? Uh, he says, oh, I'm just standing here. And I said to him, well, why aren't you in there? He says, oh, I can't go in there. I said, why can't you go in there? He said, because my Jesus is not in there. This is a 20-year-old man. And I said to him, then, if your Jesus is not in there, then why are you hanging out here? Why are you standing outside? He says, because my friends are in there. And I'm praying for them. 
They hit me, you know. It's like a ton of bricks fall on you. And I, I, I congratulated him and said something, whatever, I can't remember, and walked off. And he came running after me and he said, uh, do you mind if I have a chat to you? And I said, no, come. And we took two chairs and we sat there in the foyer. It was a big foyer, about a quarter of this room. And all the other halls came off from this central foyer. And we sat and we chatted. And he said, tomorrow, if they have the youth meeting in here, can we, can we meet again? And I said, sure. Because it was a free time, there were no lectures. In any ways, it wouldn't have had been possible to have a lecture. Too much noise, right? And then uh, the next day, I went there, and there were 20. While the noise was going on in there. And the next day, I went there, and there were 200. While the noise was going on in there. And you know what? Every single one of them said, we don't really want to be in there. We don't really want to. We don't have stupid youth. They were born with brains and they can see. What the youth hates is hypocrisy. They cannot stand hypocrisy. They'd rather have purple hair and five nose rings than to live with hypocrisy. And by the way, purple hair and five nose rings is not a sign of apostasy, it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help. So don't give up on your youth and don't give up on this church. And the positive things in the church is that there is this groundswell. Back to basics. Back to Bible-based faith. Back to the Word. Back to the pillars. And back to singing songs which have meaning besides noise. I hate to stop it. <laughs> Another break. A song. Another song. I thought you said you was going to sing at the end. Yes, to get the people out. <laughs> Start singing. No, we need, we need to probably put an end to this. These guys have had a long day. I mean, I get tired when I just preach a regular sermon. I can imagine what they're going through. So we want you to come back when? Monday, what time? Oh, you got it. You're a good teacher. Can't we have another 15 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. He's outvoted. <laughs> okay, 15 minutes. I'll throw my shoe at you if you go beyond. You stop me. I'll stop you. Good. Is Mormonism considered a Christian religion? How is the Mormon religion connected to Catholicism? Well, is it a Christian religion? They call themselves Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, don't they? But the Pope also calls himself a Christian. Now, if you consider what their prophets have said, that the devil told the truth about Godhead, that their doctrine teaches that there is a father and a mother God. We actually went to the Mormon temple, and I had a long chat with a Mormon. I'm sneaky. And I tried to make him verbalize this doctrine, but he wouldn't. You know the guys that uh, take you through the foyers, you're not allowed into the temples. But I'm very persistent. What say you, Francie? Yes, aspris. Aspris, yeah. What is that in English? 
You hot headed man. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept on and I, I kept asking about the father, mother, God aspect. And this little girl, this Mormon girl, came up and she said, uh, We sing it. And I said to her, oh, That's nice. Could you sing it for me? And I took out my little recorder. <laughs> and the guy first freaked, but eventually she sang it. And eventually I met another little Mormon girl, and we spoke about all these doctrines, and she today is a Seventh-day Adventist, just so, by the way. So it sometimes pays to be sneaky. Mormonism teaches that there is a father and a mother God. It's a a cult, sex-based religion. Like all occult religion, the sexual aspect is central. Also, they claim to be of the order of Melchizedek. Now that priesthood belongs to whom? Belongs to Christ. So they are taking the title of Alta Christos, another Christ. Who else takes that title? The papacy takes that title. Now, Father, Mother, God have nothing else to do in heaven than to reproduce. And so they're producing these millions and millions of spirit babies. Now, in order to accommodate these spirit babies and to give them bodies, you need to keep up with Father, Mother, God up there and procreate like crazy down here. So it would be best for one man to have plenty of women so that these spirit babies can be accommodated. Just from that little bit. Is it a Christian religion or is it pagan? It's pagan. But it has the most beautiful music and the beautiful choirs and they sing the most beautiful Christian songs. And their evangelism thrust is based on music. Fascinating. Not rock music. Beautiful music. Satan is a master, isn't he? He can use rock music and he can use beautiful music. I dare not trust my senses. I can only trust the Word of God. That's all I can trust. And I've been with high leaders in our own ranks who think that Mormonism and we are on the same page. We believe in the same God. Excuse me. Their own prophets turn the word of God upside down and they claim to be able to achieve Godhood. So no, they are not a Christian religion. And there was a Jesuit by the name of Desmet. And De Smet was a personal friend of Joseph Smith. And they together worked on this issue. And what are the Mormons really famous for? For their genealogies. If you want to have a record of where you come from, you can go into their web pages and find out what your genealogy is. God keeps a perfect record of our genealogies, yes or no? Yes. Don't you think the devil does so as well? And if you look at the space program, if you manage to sneak into one of the Masonic temples, it's best to have a, a nice looking wife if you want to do that. We did it here in the south in America. We came past the Mormon temple and they had a break and there was a, they had a huge gathering of all the Mormons, all the Masons and the, the whole party was mingling around outside. And I said to my wife, let's mingle. She freaked. We mingled. And they all had these Masonic badges and we had none. And then the break was over and they all went back into the, the lodge and we marched with them. And there was a watch who was watching everybody as they came in. But they let us in. We walked in with them. They had a huge concert going on in their theater. And this man started talking 
to us. But he was a little bit more interested in my wife, who was a couple of years younger at that stage, than me. Why would that be, Francis? Human nature. <laughs> <laughs> this man is very wise, take note. Human nature. So I whispered to my wife, keep him busy. <laughs> Which he did. And she asked him, what is this? What is this? No, he was fluttering all over. And I trust her, so I snuck off into the back rooms with my camera and took all the pictures I could. <laughs> and you know what struck me? If you go to the space program or you go to the political program, there are only two groups that ever get up into those top echelon space activities. You either have to be a Mason or you have to be a Mormon. And both of them are subject to the Jesuits. I don't know whether that answers your question, but we'll leave it there. Is it a mistake to purchase an ionizing water unit if I'm a vegan? <laughs> what do you say, Franzi? It's all right. Let her do it, Walter. Franzi says it's okay. <laughs> what is spiritual formation? I've already done it, right? Don't let your children go into a secret chamber in their imagination and talk with a, a secret Alice in Wonderland apparition. Don't let it happen. And don't use contemplative prayer or body prayer or any one of those. I don't have to tie myself into a yoga knot and shove my toes into my ears to get God's attention. <laughs> Isn't that right? God says the relationship between a man and a woman is a type of the relationship between him and his church. Is that right? Now if I had to go and sit and tie myself into a knot and pluck my toes into my ears on my carpet at home, my wife would sooner or later come to me and say, excuse me, what are you doing? And I would say to her, I'm trying to get your attention, dear. <laughs> she would think I'm totally bonkers, right? <laughs> so would God. My pastor, a seminary graduate, tells me that it is okay to wear jewelry and drink wine. Oh, I know presidents who say that. What says the Bible? What say you? Francie, move from chapter 17 to 12 and don't drink <laughs> wine. Did you get that? Man, this man is naughty. He said, move from chapter 17 to chapter 12. A reference, I assume, to Revelation chapter 17, where you have the whore of Babylon. And chapter 12, where you have the Bride of Christ. That's a very subtle way of putting it, Francis. Short and sweet. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, that he may be drunk. Wine in the Bible is either fermented or unfermented. And you have to read from the connotation as to what it is. Do not put new wine into old wine skins or they will burst. Because the bacteria of fermentation are in there. So you had to put it into a new wine skin. So it had to be unfermented wine. If the symbolism for sin is the yeast and the bread was to be unleavened, how much more so the wine? And we are living in the anti-typical Day of Atonement. And Jacob, 
But when he wrestled with the angel, took his people on the way to meeting his brother, and they all took off their jewelry and they buried it under the terebinth tree. They went through chapter 17, they went through the car wash, they came out the other side totally pale and without any jewelry. They looked just like Seventh day Adventists. <laughs> so, ladies, when you go through the Revelation 17 car wash, Beware the spray is so hard it could remove the duco of your car and you could come out very pale on the other side. But better come out pale on the other side and go to heaven. The symbolism is what it's about. There's no sin in jewelry. <coughs> if I remember correctly, the nose ring which was the symbol of the wedding relationship that was put onto the nose of, was it Rebecca or Rachel? Rebecca. Rebecca. Weighed a half a shekel. And a half a shekel is the weight of redemption money. It's a symbol. And the removal of the jewelry <coughs> is a symbol of the laying aside of self for the sake of Christ. I'm sure you will be beautifully decked in heaven. But right now we're living out an anti-typical relationship. And we don't need external display to show who and what we are. Do I have to wear a cross to show that I'm a Christian? Then I have to wear a big cross to show that I'm a good Christian? and a gold cross to show that I'm a mega Christian? <laughs> or does my character and my behavior display my relationship with God? Amen. A beautiful character is the best jewelry that anyone can wear. Amen. My understanding is that sin is anything that falls short of the revealed will of God. A need to break the use of jewelry in the S. It's a similar question. I think we've dealt with it, right? There's only one definition of sin in the Bible, and that is sin is the transgression of the law. Some people say, no, it's separation. What came first? Your sins have separated you from your God. Sin came first, then separation. God never sought separation. If the definition is sin is separation, then all I have to do is get a telephone and get my connection with God right and I'm saved. No, obedience is the criterion. Why were they kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Because of disobedience. What will be the requirement to get it back? Obedience. But I can't obey if I'm dead. So how do I get spiritual life? Christ in me. That's the only way. That's true salvation. Get back to basic Seventh-day Adventist theology and you will be safe on biblical grounds. New theology is dangerous. Are the 15 minutes up or shall we do this no, it's one? it's five minutes gone. Five minutes gone. <laughs> Just hurry up, Walter, please. <laughs> Francie, what's wrong with the New King James Version? You like it? Yes. The Bible I'm using here is the New King James Version. Now, not everything in this New King James Version is right. And so there are a couple of verses, lots of them, where I've written the real translation. For example, everywhere where 
the old version calls Jesus the son or the child. Not everywhere, but in most places. The child Jesus. It's changed to the servant Jesus. There's a problem with that. Hebrews 9 verse 11. No, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's wrong. That destroys the sanctuary doctrine that we have. So not everything in this version is correct. And the word there is hagion, which should never be translated most holy place, unless your name is Ford. If it's most holy place, then it must be hagia hagion. So it cannot be right, and so you must be careful if you want to defend your doctrine. Of course, if you have uh, another translation, the newer ones, then the whole of, of Hebrews is written in most holy chamber. Then you have a mega problem. So it's nice in terms of having every single verse that's in the received text. It's nice in that it has a modern English, but just fix it where it's wrong. Carry on, Walter. You're not like my wife. My wife always puts the brakes on me. No, I'm the petrol. <laughs> <laughs> the gas. The gas. The gas. Okay. Then there's another question on here. As Seventh-day Adventist, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas? Ooh, ooh. Oh, here's another one. As Seventh-day Adventist, is it appropriate to celebrate Christmas? You know, and then we use statements from the Spirit of Prophecy about Christmas trees, and we don't fully understand them and pull them out of context. What does Christmas mean? Christ Mass. And Mass is the celebration of the death of Christ in perpetuity, forever and ever. Christ remains a corpse. <coughs> Catholicism uses a crucifix. <coughs> they celebrate the corpse of Christ. I don't celebrate the corpse of Christ. I celebrate a risen Savior. Christmas is on the 25th of December. The 25th of December was the birth of Osiris, was the birth of Isis, was the birth of Zeus, was the birth of Tammuz, was the birth of... Oh, you could rattle them off. They all had the birthday on the same day. What a boring situation. And then we have different groupings in the world. We have the Russians keeping Christmas one day. We have uh, the Westerns keeping it on another day. And they're all slightly out. Why? Because it was the solstice. <coughs> Excuse me. And the solstice was when the sun returned in its cycle between summer and winter. So there are two solstices in the year. And that different nations celebrated at different times. And it's interesting that uh, these gods traveled across the sky in a coach drawn by animals. Depending on what deity it was, it was a different animal. If it was Zeus, it would be a goat. And if it was Balder, then it would be reindeer pulling the coach across the sky on the 25th of December. And then Walt Disney took this and he gave the deity inside the coach the name Santa, which if you unscramble it could also be Satan. And he was a 33 degree Freemason, so he should know what he was talking about. And so today we celebrate Santa, and the kids are more excited about Santa than about the birth of Christ, <coughs> which never happened on the 25th of December, 
because the shepherds were out in the field. And the Bible doesn't tell us when it was because it didn't want us to make a cult day of it. So now, what should be my attitude towards Christ Christmas? Now, there are Christians out there who still honestly have a religious Christian connotation with Christmas. So I must be careful and I must be gentle as a dove, but clever as a serpent. And is there anything wrong with putting a tree into my house? Is there anything wrong with putting a rose, giving my wife a rose? Is there anything wrong with it? But didn't you know that the rose is the symbol of Satan? The Rosicrucian cross, the Rosicrucians. Every Satanist, when he has a speech, will have a rose on his, on his lapel. Ha! Who's the devil to claim the rose for himself? Who made the rose? Christ made the rose. And sin added the thorns. But I can give my wife a rose because I don't feel anything for the devil's rose. And if I want to put a tree into my house or a bunch of flowers, I can do it. If I want to worship at its foot, at, oops, there's a problem. So if I come into a house and there's a tree in it, I'm not going to freak. But personally, I don't need a tree in my house. I prefer having... Jesus in my house. One year my kids said, we want a tree, we want a tree. I said, I don't need a tree. My daughter said, I want a tree. I said, well, get yourself a tree. Put it in your house. Fill your whole room with a tree and sleep outside. <laughs> so she put a tree in the house. But there was no present under the tree. I said to my kids, okay, I'll make a deal with you. It costs so much to buy all these Christmas presents. I'll give you the money on condition you spend it on the first day that the stores open after Christmas. Because then everything will be on sale and you'll get twice as much for the money as everybody else got. Nah, it'll all be gone, it'll all be sold. They moaned like crazy, just, just bear with me. And then that first day we went and I gave them the money and they went into those stores and they went ballistic. <laughs> and they got all the things that the other kids had and twice as much and they were so excited that they couldn't wait for Christmas to be over so that they could go to the stores. <laughs> Thank you for saving me, Pastor Bob. It's time for you to sing. Where's the penis? You're outvoted. You're outvoted. <laughs> Fifteen minutes of your singing. So then they can go. <laughs> you have to sing. You said they will go if you sing. Let no man tell you your duty. Okay. okay. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Oh, gracious Father. It's been a royal Sabbath day. Amen. This is what church is supposed to be. Time of studying your word, being able to ask questions, just drawing together and fellowshipping together and putting our focus of attention upon our Creator and our Redeemer. We've done that today. We are so grateful. Now we're to go our separate ways. We just pray for the protection of the Holy Spirit that will be with each and every one of us as we leave here this evening. Until we can come back again Monday evening, Lord, draw us closer even yet to your heart because we want to be ready when Jesus comes. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night. We'll see you Monday Thank evening, you. 630.